Hello Noble Ones, welcome back to my channel. This is the Metatron speaking. Today we're going to talk about medieval swords. Were they blunt or were they sharp? Well, without further ado, let's get to it. Alright then, well thank you very much for coming back to my channel. I'm really happy that you enjoyed the last video that I made. And uh, today I decided to talk again about medieval Europe and particularly about this topic and debate on, uh, on swords. Now I think this whole concept of medieval swords being blunt comes from a misunderstanding of uh, medieval treatises, particularly those that have to do with um, half swording. Because when you see, when someone sees a, a picture such as this one, then perhaps the first thing that comes to mind might be, well, if they are um, holding the sword from, from the blade, if they are touching the blades, then most likely these swords were blunt. And, and then the whole misconception of medieval people being uh, barbarians and who were just trying to uh, bash, bashing at each other all the time with their uh, blunt swords and spread out and was kind of um, strengthened by uh, further misconceptions. But I believe that upon recent evidential proof that I found in manuals and treatises, um, the situation should possibly change. So let's get to it very quickly. Now, honestly, uh, I think that this very topic is not one of those topics that we don't really have enough information to talk about. I literally think that this topic is not up for debate. I, th I think that medieval swords were definitely sharp, and I will prove it to you in a moment. But, um, and, and I believe that as medieval enthusiasts, uh, as you are, you probably have encountered people that kept on saying, no, medieval swords were blunt. But how can you prove it to them that they weren't? Well, we can't really use archaeological evidence because, unfortunately, in, you know, with the passing of centuries, swords get dull. So if you, if you look at an actual sword from a museum, um, you will find it blunt. So it's not a, a you know, a, a archaeological evidence is not going to uh, help us in this case. Although we do have to say that there are exceptions to this rule because Okishot has published and publicly announced that one of their swords from their collection, and we're talking about uh, at least a 15th century sword, 16th century sword, has kept sharp and it's still sharp enough to be able to cut um, paper. So that is remarkable, but not many, not much evidence there. Secondly, we don't really have a, a book on universal sharpness of swords. But why would there be? Sword edges varied in sharpness, even if we only look at a medieval specimen. Also, we have to consider three very important factors. Usage, time frame, and type of sword. What were the swords we are discussing designed for? What was their intended use? This will definitely change the sharpness and the degree of sharpness of the blade. So I reckon that the real answer is, in this case, that the sharpness of swords in the Middle Ages and in Europe varied to such an extent that it would be impossible to have one uh, book which tells us uh, the exact sharpness of, of, of all swords. However, how can we look for the norm? So we can't use archaeology, we don't have books written by uh, smiths that can tell us this, what we have is combat manuals. Now, um, you, know, you, you know that I watch uh, Scholar Gladiatoria and, and I have to say that Matt Easton's passion for uh, medieval treatises has rubbed off and I've, I myself have been looking uh, a lot into these treatises um, trying to find answers and I believe that in this case the answer is right there. So we are going to examine German combat manuals and Italian combat manuals. So let's begin for the German ones. In German combat manuals what they refer to uh, as we talk about how to use a longsword are three main kinds of attacks. We've got cuts, pierces and slices. Now of course piercing aside, which you know has to do with the tip, is it possible to cut with a blunt sword? Technically it is, although it's not very effective, but I have tried this myself um, as I was sparring with my friends. Of course we use blunt weapons and other implements of combat and uh, such as wooden wasters, but we were using a, a blunt sword and a couple of times it happened I was hit here and it kind of left a little cut and uh, I also hit my, a friend of mine on the hand and it kind of cut him, although I did not use much uh, power at all. So uh, blunt swords do cut, although technically probably rather than chopping, which actual cutting is, it's probably splitting, but we're not going to get technical here. What's interesting though is that with a blunt sword it is impossible to slice. 
So what do we mean by slicing? Well, essentially, a slicing is the sliding motion of the sword after it has stayed, had contact with the uh, surface that you want to, uh, to slice, uh, which can either be by pushing or pulling. Can a dull sword slice? Absolutely not. I'm going to prove it to you. This sword is dull. Can it slice? Well, let's give it a try. On my arm, considering I've got two, it's not a problem. So, there we go. You can actually hear the metal rubbing against my skin and my arm is absolutely fine. Nothing. Now, let's try with a sharp sword. Of course, I'm joking. Um, no, I'm not going to try this, you'll have to take my word for it, but if I did the same motion, the exact same thing, with the exact same strength with this sharp sword, um, I would probably reach my bone very quickly. Hence, me refusing to do it. So, essentially, it would not make sense for these combat manuals to talk about slicing, and they do talk about slicing quite a lot, I'm going to mention another example now in a moment, but it would not make sense to talk about slicing if they were using blunt swords. It just wouldn't be possible to do it, and we have just tested it on my arm. Also, there are other German manuals which talk about techniques on how to counter someone after going into a bind. It says that when you go into the bind, you should perform a slicing motion and then move to half swording, you know, holding, gripping uh, the blade of the sword with your other uh, hand. So what this proves is that the implement that they were using uh, as they were talking, uh, teaching these techniques were swords that could slice, hence they were sharp, and they could half sword with it, uh, with them, and so which means that you can actually half sword with a sharp and live blade, which I have done many times. I'm not going to demonstrate this now again because I don't want to having to clean the blade of the sword again from my sweat, which is the, a terrible enemy. Any one of you who, uh, who owns uh, medieval uh, swords will know that if it's not stainless, you have to clean it and oil it all the time, and sweat is the worst enemy. So I'm not going to do this, but I have proved it quite a lot of times that you can, and I think that, that you can half sword and grip the sword from the blade, even if it's sharp. Now, moving to the Italian manuals. Um, if we read De Arte Gladiatoria di Micandi, written by Filippo Valdi, uh, we will see that he sort of mentions a, a different situation, which is only mentioned on his manual. And what it is, is talking about um, swords that were supposed to be dull um, up from the uh, forte of the sword, from the hilt, up to a few inches from the tip, and you ha actually had to sharpen only the very uh, latest part, last part portion of the sword, um, because it was a sword used for piercing. Now, these swords, most likely a stock or tux, uh, were swords specifically designed for armoured combat. Why? Because again, you can't slice through armor. Um, because you can't slice through metal. Um, it should be common sense, but unfortunately, it's not. Uh, if you have a look at Hollywood and video games, but yeah, it's impossible. So, um, so what they're really teaching us there is that if you really wanted to have a sword as a secondary weapon, um, then and you were going to fight other uh, opponents in full plate armor, then you might as well want to have it um, prepared for that. You might want to have a sword which is a good implement for half swording, because at the end of the day, um, your main weapon is most likely going to be either a mace, a warhammer, or a pole arm. And if you lose that, and you want to use your sword and change it into a mini pole arm, but because of the effectiveness of such uh, uh, weapons. This is sort of um, a special situation, a specially designed implement, not the norm. Thirdly, the next argument I'm going to use uh, to bring to the table today is common sense, or shall we say common tactical sense. If all medieval swords were dull, then I think that one of the most, the, the great, greatest problems that we would have during any kind of dueling and combat, and I'm talking about unarmored combat, is the fact that your opponent, or you yourself, could grab the opponent's blade. Now, this is not something to underestimate, it's an incredibly effective technique. It could actually be done even on a live sword, but of course, a live blade, but of course that would be uh, a bit more risky, and you know, it, it, only in certain situations would you do that. But if the opponent's head, if my opponent had a blunt sword, and again, I use this in sparring, in fact, my friends hate it when I do it, um, uh, you know, when, when we bind, or something like this, um, I use my left 
hand to grab their their sword, most likely either from the forte or from the strong or from the middle of their blade. And at the same time, I remove mine. So what this and it's very easy to do. It's very very easy to do, particularly if your opponent is not expecting you to do that with dull swords. If that's the case, if that happens, you're only left with two options. You either let your weapon go, in which case you either go away and have won the fight, or you use, for example, a dagger, but now I have a huge um, reach advantage, which is a very, which is going to make the difference anyways, because when you have a reach advantage, you have a huge advantage. Um, or you can try to stay there and wrestle with me and try to get your sword back. But let me tell you, each second you spend manoeuvring and trying to, to uh, you know, retrieve your weapon is a, is a second that I'm going to use to hit you and pound you and pound you again until I actually turn you into a walking Yorkshire pudding, which I don't think you would want me to do. And so at the end of the day, I think the, the actual result will be the same, you letting the weapon go eventually. So if this were the case, I think manuals and treatises would have talked all the time about how not to let your opponent grab your blade. They don't, occasionally they do, but they don't, which means most likely these blades were sharp, so it was not an easy thing to do. Not impossible, but not easy. All right, then I think that this kind of wraps it up, and uh, I, I think I've covered all the points I wanted to cover. Uh, I myself have to say in conclusion that I shudder uh, to think that uh, I had to go to combat uh, fighting with a weapon that was not sharp. It doesn't really make sense. Perhaps I wouldn't make it this sharp as like ra razor blade. I don't think that razor sharp, sorry, because I don't think that that's actually a good point. Because every time you, um, you know, all the sliding uh, out and in the scabbard would eventually blunt the sword um, and also a sword which is completely and entirely razor sharp um, would be more fragile and that's not something that I would want so I think but again I think it depended on the person depending on the smith independent on the knight and personal preference I myself would have my sword sharp enough to be able to perform slicing properly um, but I wouldn't so I would definitely not have it dull but I would also uh, rather uh, avoid having my sword to be too sharp because in that case it would I think that it, during a bind with a sword which would be uh, thicker, my sword would be damaged all the time and, and chipped. All right then, thank you very much for watching, and remember, the Metatron has spread his wings. Goodbye. All right then, I hope you enjoyed this video. Thank you very much for your time. If you liked my content, please remember to subscribe to my channel for more content from the Metatron. Goodbye, I hope to see you soon.